Over the past year, i3 window manager has been my absolute favorite window manager. And I still think that i3 is my favorite, and I'll probably return to it someday, but I'm kind of on a review streak, if you will. I'm currently using Qtile, and I've been using Qtile now for about three weeks, maybe a little bit longer. So what I wanted to do today is compare these two. I've used Qtile long enough to kind of get a sense of what it's all about and how to configure it and how to rice it and all this stuff. And I used i3 for a very long time. So I feel like I can do a pretty good job of comparing these two. So that's what we're going to do today. Now before we jump in, I should say that I'm not going to declare a winner out of either of these two. These are both excellent window managers and if I were to give one piece of advice out of all this, I would say try them both. While it may take up some time to do and to configure both of them, I would say try them and that's going to be the easiest way to discover which one works best for you. But if you want to know some more information, let's go ahead and jump into the comparison. So we're going to start with i3. Now when it comes to i3, i3's installation is fairly easy. i3, the regular version of i3 at least, is available in most repos on almost every distribution. So you'll be able to install it with your package manager. If you are looking for a variant of i3, specifically probably i3 gaps, that's going to be a little bit more rare when it comes to being in a repository. If you're using Arch, you'll be able to download it via the AUR. If you're using something like Ubuntu, you're probably going to have to build it from source. If you're using Fedora, you can get it from a copper repo. So if you're just going to use the non-GAPS version, you're going to have a very easy time installing it. If you're using the GAPS version, you're going to have to work a little bit harder for it. Personally, I always use the GAPS version just because it's better to have the option to use GAPS and then not use them than to not have them in your i3 and then want them later on, if that makes sense at all. Now, i3 is a manual tiler. Basically, what that means is that you decide where the window is going to spawn next. So as you'll see in the B-roll, you'll see that each window spawns in the same direction until I press a key binding, which causes the windows to go in another direction. Basically, this allows you total control over where a window is spawned when you open it. In terms of configuration, i3 is configured in what I call a user-readable configuration file. And what I mean by that is that it's not configured in a coding language per se. It's not coded in C or Python or Haskell or anything like that. It's very much its own type of thing, and it's very easy to read and easy to configure no matter your skill level. So things like declaring workspace variables, things like declaring key bindings, stuff like that, all that stuff is very easy to do, very easy to kind of suss out as to how it's done. One of my personal favorite things about a window manager is the workspaces. And with i3, workspaces are done incredibly well. You can decide how many workspaces you have in i3. You can have as many as you want. All you have to do is put them inside of your configuration file and then put corresponding key bindings to each of those workspaces inside your configuration file. Now, obviously, you have to have keys for those workspaces and those key bindings available to you. So eventually, you would probably run out of keys because there's eventually going to be, uh, you know, a lack of combinations that you can use, but that's going to be a lot of workspaces. You're probably never going to need that many. Personally, I use 19 workspaces. I know that's a lot, but in i3, 19 workspaces work really well for me, and I've talked about workspaces in i3 in another video. I will link that in one of the cards above me. One of the most customizable parts of any window manager is the bar. Now, unlike something like BSPWM or Xmonad, i3 comes with its own bar. It's called i3 bar. And the default way of putting widgets or modules or whatever inside of that bar is called i3 status. i3 status is fairly configurable. Most people don't really use it, but it can be done. I've also just done a video on i3 blocks, which is kind of an upgrade super version of i3 status, which allows you to do quite a bit more in terms of customization. A lot of people who use i3 ditch the standard bar altogether and use a third-party bar like Polybar or Tint2 or EWW or something like that. And one of the great things about i3 is that it really does a good job of allowing you to use whatever bar you want to use. Most bars support i3. There are several third-party bars that only support i3, things like Lemon, Lemon Bar and Bumblebee Bar and things like that. Most of those bars, like I said, were either built specifically for i3 or 
or do a really good job of supporting i3 out of the box. And i3 itself, obviously, is very easy to configure with a third-party bar. You can simply remove the standard default bar by commenting out three lines in the standard configuration file, and that just turns off the bar. And then you can run whatever third-party bar you want in whatever manner you're supposed to do so. The next thing we should talk about is community. When it comes to community and the community surrounding i3, i3 has a very large community because it's one of the most popular window managers. And what this means for you is that if you need support, chances are it's going to be very easy to get support or at least get answers to your question. Also, and this is something that I find very nice, the developer of i3 is very active within the community and often answers the questions himself. So if you are having some issues with i3 or there's something going on that you need help with, chances are you'll be able to go to places like Reddit or certain discords, things like that, and find the help that you need. And because the community is so large, you're probably going to get a fairly fast response. Of course, adding on top of that is the absolutely excellent documentation. In my opinion, i3 has the best documentation of any window manager, and I'm showing this on screen right now. It is a very condensed, codified documentation. It's all in one place, and it's very well organized. And the best part about it, in my opinion, is that it's non-technical. And by non-technical, I just mean that it's not written for developers, if that makes sense. You can be a just a random Joe Schmo off the street, read the i3 configuration file and understand basically everything in it perfectly fine. I know that's the way I've been. I'm not a developer. And even when I was just beginning in Linux, just beginning with tiling window managers, i3's documentation was very, very easy to read and understand. The final thing that I want to talk about in i3 before we get into some pros and cons is that i3 does have several variants. So I've already talked about one of these, i3 gaps. Basically, that's i3 just with added gap support. There are a couple other variants as well. The biggest one out there is probably Sway. Sway Window Manager is not a fork of i3, but it is very closely related in that it uses the same configuration file. Sway is basically i3, but with the Wayland compositor. So instead of using Xorg, it uses Wayland. And if that's something that you're interested in trying out, that exists, it, and it does use your i3 configuration file. So if you have an existing i3 config file, you can use that inside Sway, and you won't have to start over from scratch. The only place that's not absolutely true is with the bar. Sway does its own bar thing, and you kind of have to deal with the bar there separately than you would in i3. Let's go ahead then and jump into some pros and cons of i3 window managers. So starting on the positive side, the first one, and I think that this is probably the biggest pro, is that it's configured in a user-readable format. And basically why I think that this is so big is because it enables people who aren't developers to dive right into a configuration file and tweak to their heart's content. It's really, really simple to get started configuring and ricing and all that stuff with i3. And if you compare and contrast that to something like Qtile, it's much easier to get into i3 simply because you don't have to know Python or you don't have to know Haskell or something like you would in Xmonad. You can just dive right in, look at the documentation, and even if you don't look at the documentation, you can kind of figure out just reading the configuration file what things are going on there. Another pro is that i3 has excellent third-party bar support. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't use third-party bars with Qtile. You can. I'll talk about that later. But with i3, it's very, very simple. It's very simple to disable the default bar. So you can just disable the default bar, plop in polybar or whatever, and it just works. And because i3 is so popular, most of the bars that you'd want to use with i3 have i3 support. So you're not going to have to worry about your workspaces not showing up or not being functional, things like that. And that's definitely a problem with things like Awesome Window Manager and Xmonad, where those really weren't built for polybar at least. And you have the same problem with some other bars as well when it comes to those other window managers. With i3, third-party bar support is fantastic. 
The third pro that I want to talk about, and I've already discussed this a little bit, is that they have excellent non-technical do documentation, which means that you can dive in, not know anything about a coding or programming language, and pretty much understand every word uh, that is in there and be able to come out on the other side knowing basically everything there is to know about i3 Window Manager. And the final pro is one that, again, that I've already talked about. Because i3 is so popular, it has a very large community. That means that you're going to be able to find support very easily and in any number of places. And if you have an issue, you can go to these places and find the support that you need. It's not as niche as Qtile. So while you can get support with Qtile, there's plenty of people there in the community that are willing to help you. It's not quite as large as the i3 community and your response times may be a little bit shorter in i3 than it is in Qtile. So despite me being a bit of a i3 fanboy, I am also going to name some cons. So the first one is that it's non-extensible. So because it's configured in a user readable configuration file, you're constrained to what you can do with that configuration file. Everything that you can do in that configuration file has been coded for you. It's all included right out of the box. There's nothing there that you can add on top of that without knowing some programming language or some scripting language at least to kind of extend it yourself. There's no patching like you would find in DWM. There's no adding stuff to the actual configuration file because it's not in a coding language. It's just pre-configured for you. The options that it has are the option it has. It's not going to have any more than that ever. The second con is related to that is that it's not configured in its native language, which means that you're reliant on the options in the configuration file that were coded for you. You don't have access or at least easy access to the code. All that stuff kind of happens in the background. Instead, you're using this user readable configuration file and it just kind of means that you have less control over everything. So if that bothers you, if you're not interested in using a configuration file that is kind of more constrained, then i3 may not be for you. Uh, the third one is probably the biggest con for a lot of people, and that is that it's a manual tiling window manager. A lot of people do not like manual tilers. They prefer to have a dynamic tiling window manager like Qtile, and it really does come down to a matter of taste, which is why at the beginning I told you to try both of them. Manual tiling just doesn't really work for a lot of people simply because they want to have it set up so that there's a layout available to you that has a more readable function than just things popping up along the window one by one by one and only changing that layout with a actual user intervention. So a lot of people prefer to have things like auto tiling enabled with i3. There's a script that allows you to do that. But that's an add-on extra, and it's something that they've done through like a bash script. But for most people who just use vanilla i3 or i3 gaps, you're going to have to deal with that manual tiling aspect of it, and that's not for everybody. The last con that I want to talk about is one that's not really a con, I don't think, and that is that they use some really weird key bindings out of the box. The biggest one and the biggest example is that they use JKL semicolon for the movement keys. Now, if you've used Vim or you're used to using other window managers, you'll know that's a little weird because most window managers use HJKL, which are the Vim keys. But for me personally, it doesn't seem weird to me, even though I always change it to the Vim keys. If you just think about it a little while, your hands on your keyboard, if you're using QWERTY, are on, are supposed to be on, at least if you're using touch typing, you're supposed to have your, key, your four fingers on JKL semicolon. That's the reason why they have that in the configuration file. Uh, but it's easy to change, so I don't really consider it a con. You just go in there and change it to the Vim keys, and you're ready to go. It's not that big of a deal. So that is i3. Let's go ahead and jump into Qtile. So the first thing that you should know, of course, is about installation. Installation is astonishingly simple for Qtile. It's in almost every repository you can think of. There are no extra variants that you have to really worry about when you install it. It just installs. Now, obviously... There is the whole idea that sometimes, depending on what distribution you're going to be using, you're probably going to be using an older version of Qtile, but for the most part, that's not going to be that big of a deal. As long as it works, you're going to be happy. And you can, if you want the latest and greatest, and you're not using something like Arch or something, you can build it yourself. It's fairly easy. The one thing that you should note when you do download Qtile is that you're probably going to be downloading a whole bunch of Python libraries, which is not that big a deal because you probably have a whole bunch of those on your system anyways. But... Whereas i3 is written in C, 
So you're not going to be downloading a whole bunch of libraries there because you're going to have a whole bunch of C stuff on your computer anyways. With i3, you're probably going to be downloading a whole bunch of extra libraries, which means you're going to have some extra dependencies there and you're going to have to kind of worry about that, especially if you're building stuff from scratch. Unlike i3, Qtile is a dynamic tiling window manager, which as you're seeing in the B-roll that's showing right now, basically means that there is a given profile layout that comes by default. And in the case of Qtile, the default layout is called master stack. Basically what that means is you have one large window along the left-hand side, and then a small stack of windows, the more you open them up on the, on the right-hand side. And Qtile does have other layouts that are available to you, probably about 12 layouts actually. I'm not sure if that's the right number, but a fair number. Uh, things like floating, monocle, reverse monad, things like that, where you have different layouts that you can kind of choose from depending on what you prefer. Uh, like I said, by default it is the master stack layout, and basically the dynamic portion of this just means that everything is set in a layout for you, you don't have to choose where the windows are going to spawn next. If you're in a certain layout, you know exactly where the next window is going to spawn. In terms of configuration, Qtile is configured in Python, so it is highly useful, and I'll talk about this more in the pros and cons, for you to know some Python in order to get into this. Now, that being said, if you don't know any Python, it's not insurmountable that you can actually jump into this and learn how to configure it. I don't know hardly any Python at all, and I was able to get in there and kind of understand what was going on within a couple days. We will talk about the documentation here in a few minutes, but it is fairly easy to get in there and and kind of muck around and learn enough to the point where you can rice it and configure your key bindings. As long as you emulate what is there, you're probably going to be just fine. And as you use Qtile for any amount of time, if you stick with it, you're going to learn some, or at least enough Python to know how to do certain things. So things like adding in scratch pad support and stuff like that is fairly simple, but you kind of have to know that it's there in order to do it. So it is configured in Python, and that means that you're going to have to follow the rules of Python. So you're going to have to put commas where they need to go. You're going to need to put brackets and things like that where they need to go. Otherwise, you're going to get errors. So because it's a programming language, you have to follow the rules of the programming language. Now, one thing to say about that is that Python is a fairly forgiving coding language. If you make some mistakes, it's usually fairly easy to spot them. And Qtile set up in a way that most of the time, you're, it's going to tell you exactly where you've made a mistake. So. Qtile is configured in Python, and that is a big difference from i3, which is, again, in a user-readable format. Like with i3, Qtile will allow you to use basically any number of workspaces that you want. The difference is, is that the way the configuration is done for your workspaces, or groups as they call them in Qtile, is that each workspace is named. What I mean by that is that by default, you have workspaces 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, those are the workspaces. Each workspace has a number as its name. And the way that it's configured by default is that the name is also corresponding to the key binding that you want it to, ha to have. So, for example, if you wanted to have a workspace called workspace A, you could do that. You could define a workspace A and because you've assigned it the letter A, that would also be the key binding. So the names and the key bindings kind of go hand in hand. It's a little confusing and it's not something that you're going to have an easy time adding more than like 12 workspaces simply because it's hard to find new keys that aren't taking up by other stuff. So that was my personal problem. I wanted more workspaces, but all my key bindings are kind of taken up. So that was my issue with that. One thing that you might want to note when it comes to workspaces is that names and labels are not the same. So labels are what's going to appear in the bar. Names are the names of the workspaces that correspond with the key binding. So uh, that can be a little bit confusing. You might want to check the documentation for that. So moving on to the bar, the bar in Qtile is highly configurable. And it does come standard out of the box. You do get a bar out of the box. It appears along the bottom, just like it does in, Q in i3. 
uh, and it does have some built-in widgets that are already there for you ready to go. I think the time is there. I may be wrong in terms of that, but the way you configure the bar in Qtile is done inside the Qtile configuration file, config.py, and you basically choose what widgets you want to use. So each thing that resides in the bar is a widget. So for example, in the B rule you're seeing now, along the left hand side you see the groups or the workspaces that's one widget and then you in, in the center i have another widget and then i have a whole bunch of other widgets on the right hand side like weather and stuff like that each of those things is called a widget the greatest thing about the qtile bar is that there are a ton of built-in widgets that you can just use they're well documented they have a, excellent options for almost every widget that you want to choose and because there are so many of them, you're probably not going to have to deal with creating your own ever. There are just a, there's at least two dozen, probably three dozen widgets that you can choose from just built in, ready for you to use. You just put them in your configuration file in the manner that you're supposed to, and it works just fine. And I find that great simply because that's not the case with every bar out there. Some bars, you pretty much do everything yourself. So... The fact that you can do pretty much whatever you want with this bar is really nice. You also have the option for a vertical bar if you want. So if you want to have a bar that runs up and down, you can do that. And most of the widgets that are available to you will also work in vertical mode. The next thing we should talk about is the community. Now, Qtile is not as popular as i3, at least when it comes to the number of people who take part in discussions about it on like Reddit and stuff, whatever. So I don't have like any firm numbers, but you can kind of tell that i3 is more popular because you're seeing more rices and the communities on Reddit and other places are a little bit bigger. That being said, in the time that I've used Qtile, I've had not a problem at all at getting response to my questions when I've had them. So like the Qtile subreddit, you just ask your question. They were very helpful over there, even though the community is not quite as large. The next thing that we should talk about is documentation. It kind of goes hand in hand with the community. The documentation for Qtile is fantastic. It does have some downsides, which I'll talk about later, but in terms of having a central place where you can find all the documentation, Qtile's documentation is fantastic. It, basically, anything you want to know about Qtile is there and well documented. There is a lot of text there that explains what's going on, how you're supposed to do things, it does, for the most part, give you examples of how things are supposed to run, especially when you're talking about the bar and stuff like that. It does have examples, which is nice. They're not always the most useful examples. So you kind of have to get into the flow of how the code for your widgets and stuff like that is supposed to work. Once you get the hang of that, the examples make a hell of a lot more sense. Uh, so the documentation is fantastic. I would not say that it's as good as i3's documentation, but I'll talk about why in a few minutes. So the last part before we jump into the pros and cons is the variants. So the chief variant, or at least the only variant that I actually know of, is the Wayland variant of Qtile, and that comes pre-installed every time you install Qtile. So when you install Qtile from your repositories, or if you build it from scratch or whatever, you're going to get the X11 version, which is going to be the default version, and you're going to get the Wayland version. Now, in terms of performance on the Wayland ver version, I can't really speak to that yet. I haven't tried it much yet, so I don't want to put any, any any opinions out there and just be completely wrong. So uh, it just know that it does come available to you if you want to try it. So uh, moving on to the pros and cons of Qtile, and as we did with i3, we'll start with the positive stuff. So because it's configured in the language that it's programmed in, uh, it's easy to extend. So if you know Python, you can basically do anything with Qtile that you want to do. You can do things in any number of ways you want to do. And because, again, it's configured in Python, if there is a library of Python that you want to import and do something with, you can do so. Obviously, again, the ability to extend this relies on your knowledge of Python. So if you don't know anything about Python, you're not going to do much extending of Qtile. But you obviously can learn Python, or at least learn some Python, and have the ability to extend it. It's kind of like DWM in this aspect, where DWM is coded and configured in C, and if you the more C you learn, the more extensible DWM becomes. It's the same thing here, only instead of C, we're looking at Python. Uh, the next pro is that it has excellent 
scratch pad support. Now, this is not going to matter to everybody. It matters to me because I love scratch pads. But basically, a scratch pad, if you don't know, is a extra terminal that kind of lives in a hidden workspace that you can bring up whenever you want and do stuff in and then, the sen then send away. It just stays running. And obviously, it's not just a terminal. You can put anything on scratch pad that you want. And the best part about the scratch pads in Qtile is that if you kill them, they can come back. You don't have to restart Qtile in order to get them back. And that's the biggest downside of scratch pads in i3, whereas if you kill it, it's dead. You can't get it back. You have to restart i3. So while they both of these window managers have scratch pads built in to them, and they're very easy to implement in both cases, I put Qtile's support of scratch pads a little bit ahead simply because they're a little bit easier to use, but also simply that they are respawnable. I suppose that that's the best way to put it, if that's even a word. Probably it's not. But anyways, scratch pad support, excellent in Qtile. Uh, the next one is something that I've already talked about, is it has an awesome and highly extensible bar. It has a ton of widgets available to you, so basically you can do anything with this bar that you could possibly conceive of. Personally, in terms of a default bar, I think that this may be the best default bar of any window manager. It beats i3's default bar by miles, in most ways at least, simply because the i3 bar by default is a little bit harder to configure simply because you have to download another configuration file and deal with a whole bunch of scripts that you may not may or may not know anything about. So with Qtile's bar, because it has a you know a huge widget base, you can just pretty much plop anything in there that you want. You can just carry on with your day. And on top of that, you can do a vertical bar if you want. There is better support for click events and things like that inside of Qtile bar than there is in the standard Qtile uh, i3 bar. So the bar in Qtile, I think, is much better. Now, that being said, of course, with i3, most people use a third-party bar. And once you open up the market to uh, a third-party bar, the bars pretty much equal themselves out in, in the end of the day. So uh, the bar in Qtile, fantastic. Uh, the fourth one is excellent documentation. Just like i3, I would say that Qtile probably has the second best documentation of any window manager out there. It's really very good. But the downside, and we're kind of dealing with a con here, is that the documentation is very technical. So if you don't know any Python, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. It's not impossible. I don't want to say that. But if you don't know any Python, it's going to be a little bit harder to navigate through the Qtile documentation. And this is especially true if you want to do something, but you don't know how to do it. And that's usually the time you'd go seek out the documentation. And the reason why I say it in that way is because if you go to the, the documentation and try to search for something that you want to do, and the only way they've described how to do it is in Python, and you don't know how to search for that particular way to do things in Python, it may it's just a little bit harder to search for stuff when you don't know what to search for, if that makes any sense at all. So uh, it's not, like I said, it's not completely unusable. A lot of times they'll have just a plain English description of what they're doing. Uh, and in fact, they have that in a lot of places. It's not in such a way that where how you search for that might be equal, if that makes any sense at all. Like the how you search for it is going to be in layman's terms, where how they describe it is going to be in like developer terms. And those things might not mesh. The last pro is that it has a built-in Wayland version, and you just get that. You don't have to go download it. You can just use it if you want to, and that's really nice. Uh, it's probably not for everybody. Most people are going to just deal with the Xorg version, but the Wayland version is there. You don't have to worry about adding an entirely different window manager to use Wayland. Moving on to the cons. The first con that I want to talk about is that adding scripts to the bar is hard. It's not something that I thought would be true, but it is hard. So if you want to use your own bash scripts in the Qtile bar, it is possible, as several people have shown to me, but it's not as easy as I had expected it to be. I thought that there'd be a widget that you could just use that says, hey, here's a here's a script. Put the output of the script in the bar. I figured that's the way it would be. But especially given with the number of widgets that they have, I figured that there'd be a, a widget like that, but there's not. So that's the first con, and that's really a me con like that's just something that i noticed that affected me but um if that's something that is important to you like you've if you've used po polybar for a long time and you have a whole bunch of your own scripts and you want to use those scripts inside of Qtile bar it's not as easy as i as you would think it would be in order to use those the second con is that pycom acts up in Qtile. now i have talked to several people who have not had this experience but i had this experience all the damn time 
And that is that PyCom just crashes in random situations. And the biggest situation is when my screen goes blank. Usually when I'm sitting here recording, just staring at the camera, my com my screens will go blank, which is their, what they're supposed to do. Uh, but when I come back, PyCom is just freaking the hell out. And for no reason, I have to kill Python in order to get to have my screens not, you know, like flash at me. It's really, really weird. And I don't like it at all. I'm not, I'm positive that this is a PyCon problem, but that being said, this does not happen in i3. So I don't know if there's some weird interaction between PyCon and Python that's going on there or what's going on. But if you use PyCon as your compositor, uh, you may discover that you have some issues there. It's not unusable. It's just noticeable. The third con is something that I've talked about before is that it's easier to configure Qtile if you know some Python. And the reason why I put this as a con is that if you are a brand new Qtile user and you don't know any Python, you're going to have a harder time configuring this than someone who knows some Python. So uh, it's not, like I said at the beginning of this section, insurmountable if you don't know any Python, but you're going to have to be willing to learn. You're going to have to put some effort into it in order to get from the point where you're just staring at the configuration file in pure horror to the point where you know at least mostly what's going on, which is kind of where I started. Like, I looked at it like, this is not as horrifying as Haskell, but it's definitely not C, which is what I'm most comfortable with. So it, it, that's where I started, and now I'm here three weeks later. I know quite a bit more Python than I did before. Still not a developer of Python, so I'm not going to claim that. But I've definitely learned quite a bit in these three weeks, and I think that most people could do that as long as they're willing to put the effort in. The next con is that Qtile has an inconsistent way of dealing with errors. So when you have an error in the configuration file, you were never going to know whether or not Qtile is going to load into the default configuration and tell you, hey, you're in a default configuration, go find that error on your own. Or you may, if you're lucky, get a notification that says, hey, this is the error, this is the line that the error is on, go fix it. And it's still actually using your configuration file, so all your key bindings work. The problem that I have here is that you never know which one of those situations you're going to find yourself in. Sometimes your configuration file is going to break completely and it's going to revert to the default configuration file. Uh, sometimes you're going to get lucky and you're going to get that notification. Now, the thing is, is that if you don't have a notifications daemon running, so something like Dunst, you're always going to get pushed into the default configuration file. And the default configuration file is not easy to use, especially if you've gotten used to using your own key bindings. So you'll definitely want to look up the default configuration file key bindings if you find yourself in that situation fairly often. So uh, you'll want to know how to restart specifically Qtile without having to shut your computer down and all the way back in uh, in order to get things to work again. Because that's the way I was at the beginning because I had no clue what the default bindings were. And every time I got there or every time I had a, you know, an error, it just went to that default configuration file, and that was a pain in the butt. Once I installed Dunst, I got the notification error much more often, and that's nice. That's a really good way to fail, and it, like I said, most of the time it will give you the line number of where your mistake was. The problem that I have is that it's not consistent, right? Sometimes you're, even once you've installed the notification daemon and you get those notifications sometimes, still sometimes you're going to fail completely and go into that default configuration file. I wish there was... Uh, some way that it would just was more consistent. And the last con that I want to talk about, and this one is probably the biggest one out of all of them, is that Qtile is very, very highly maintained. And usually that's a really good thing, and it is a good thing. I like that the developers are very involved in making Qtile better. The problem that, that comes with that is that when you get an update to Qtile, it often breaks stuff. And usually this happens with the bar and widgets and stuff. They make a change with one of their widgets or whatever, and that just breaks the bar. And usually when the bar breaks, the whole thing breaks. And that means that you have to kind of pay attention to what those updates are bringing along to you so that you know if you have to make any changes to your configuration file. Uh, the thing is, is that if this was just like one time, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But pretty much every time they do an update for Qtel, I'd say probably about 50% of the time, I suppose, I guess is the real, like if I, if I had to guess, I'd say about half the time they do an update, something is going to break. 
So that's definitely going to be something that you have to kind of keep in mind. And it's not that big of a deal as long as you kind of pay attention to when you get an update and then you know to go check the change log and see what's going on because they'll tell you when they push along a, cha a system breaking change. It's just you kind of have to seek that information out. So those are the cons of Qtile. Now, when it comes to comparing these things together, again, as I said before, the best solution for pretty much everyone is to try both because they're both really different when it comes to workflow because one's manual, one's dynamic, and which one of those things that you like is really going to depend on your experience with both of them. You really have to try them. I can't tell you, hey, manual's better automatically. I used to be able to say that. I used to be able to tell you, hey, manual's the way to go because it gives you the absolute most control over where your windows are going to spawn. I used to be of that opinion. I don't think that anymore. I think that it's more of a personal choice. A lot of people can't stand manual tilers, so they all prefer dynamic tilers. Some people really don't like the dynamic tiling way of doing things and prefer to have total control. It's, you know, your personal experience is going to decide which one of those two that you like. So that means you should try them both. I think that's the best solution. So I hope you got some good information out of this video. If you have comments or questions or any of that kind of stuff, you can leave those in the comment section below. You can follow me on Twitter at the LinuxCast. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast, just like all these fine people. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing people. Thank you so much for your support. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere close to being where it is right now. So just seriously, guys, thanks for your support. It's just thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.